Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we uh, read through uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, each of you, some of you shared um, your thoughts, uh, your learning from 1 Timothy chapter 3. So we look at, uh, or we study 1 Timothy chapter 3 in detail now. Um, we've just, uh, you know, learned or read uh, that Paul had written to women that they should not hold uh, positions of uh, a spiritual or you know doctrinal authority over uh, the congregations or, or over the church. Uh, but also Paul does not want to leave an impression that just any man you know is qualified uh, to preach and to teach or to have spiritual leadership in the church. Um, Okay, so he says that no man is qualified to be a spiritual leader in the church just because of his gender, just because he's a male. Uh, but then he goes on to state uh, the qualifications uh, that is required for those in church leadership and spiritual leadership in the church. Um, and uh, in this chapter, we see that he moves on to talk about other things uh, concerning the local church. Um, now, basically, in the early church, you know, uh, it comprised of uh, those, uh, you know, um, those who were uh, saints. The early church comprised of the saints, the, those were the believers. And then we had the bishops and the deacons. Uh, so those who served in the local church um, uh, came under two broad categories. One is that of bishops, the other is that of uh, uh, deacons. So in this chapter, you know, uh, Paul is talking about the qualifications of uh, bishops and uh, deacons. Um, and he begins by saying that, you know, um, uh, you know, this is a faithful saying, um, if a man desires the position of a uh, bishop. So basically, who is a bishop, uh, or what is the understanding of a bishop, of the term bishop, uh, 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 or the position of a bishop in the early church? Uh, the Greek word is episcope, which means a spiritual leaders. Uh, so a bishop is basically a spiritual leader, somebody who's involved in a spiritual ministry, someone who is giving uh, spiritual inputs in the lives of uh, the people of God. Uh, if we read, uh, look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28, uh, we see that uh, there it's mentioned that bishops uh, are as spiritual overseers who are to shepherd the people and take care of uh, them. Uh, but we see also in this chapter that he talks about deacons. He goes on to talk about the qualifications of a deacon. Uh, so who is a deacon? Basically, the Greek word uh, for deacon means somebody who is an attendant, somebody who's a, a waiter, uh, someone serving in a capacity, who's a serving capacity in the local church. Um, so basically deacons were responsible for any administrative work, organizational work, um, uh, support or help function, uh, help function uh, work in the uh, church and we see that this whole office of deacon uh, began uh, in Acts chapter six. You know when the apostles felt that you know preaching, teaching, prayer, uh, you know uh, taking care of the widows, the poor, uh, serving them food, all was getting too much on them. Uh, they were not getting enough time for prayer and you know preaching and teaching. So they just wanted to dedicate their time. Uh, to for uh, preaching, teaching, and for prayer, and hence they, <clears throat> you know, found uh, seven men uh, who were full of the wisdom, uh, full of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, but what was their role? Their role was basically to serve food every day to the poor and widows, uh, more like administrative work. You know, get all the groceries, keep an account. Uh, uh, distribute the food, take care of the poor widows. So the whole uh, ministry of deacons grew out of this context, Acts chapter 6. Uh, and since uh, then, you know, deacons were involved in helping uh, uh, the church, administrative work, organizational work. It does not mean that, you know, uh, they were not involved in any kind of spiritual uh, ministry. Now, out of these uh, seven men who were chosen, we know that uh, Stephen, 
uh, was also who was a deacon was also involved in children's ministry sorry <laughs> it was involved in spiritual ministry and uh, you know philip also uh, uh, went to samaria started preaching the gospel also did uh, a good spiritual ministry also was involved in uh, ministering to people and uh, <clears throat> You know, preaching and teaching the word of uh, God. So that is who a bishop is and who a deacon is. Uh, so we'll look at uh, the qualifications that Paul writes that which is required uh, for a bishop. So he says, uh, "Hey, uh, because I'm saying that women should not preach and teach and not become leaders, it does not mean that mean that any man can." Uh, be a, a spiritual leader, can be a bishop and a deacon. Uh, there are specific qualifications. And uh, Paul is also telling Timothy, when you are looking for a leader, a bishop or a deacon, these are the qualifications uh, that the person must have. These are the things that you must look for in that uh, person. Okay, so uh, he says, if a writes and says, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. So Paul is basically saying it's a good, uh, it's good to desire uh, to help and uh, to minister in the church, to be a spiritual leader, to help with organization, mill work, uh, uh, tasks or administrative tasks. Uh, it's it's a good thing to do all this good work in the church. Uh, don't quench that desire that you have. But even though it's a desire, you know, there is some standard that we need to live up to. And something uh, and a standard that God requires or expects of uh, leaders. So not anyone and everyone who has a desire can be these bishops and deacons, there is some standards we need to live up to. There is something that God expects of us as uh, leaders. And he says, a bishop then must be. That means God has specific qualifications uh, for those who are taking leadership position in the church. Um, leaders are not just to be chosen at random uh, uh, and not just because they volunteer, not just because they aspire that position uh, or they desire it, or not even because they, by birth, you know, they have the natural uh, talent to be leaders, uh, but instead they should, uh, you know, be chosen primarily on how they match these qualifications that he has listed out here. So then he goes on to list the qualifications. He says a bishop then must be uh, blameless. Um, you know, a blameless is uh, a blameless person is a person who lives a life where people cannot find fault with uh, living a right life. Uh, he must be a husband of one wife, temperate, uh, which temperate means you know some it gives us an idea of someone who's not given to the extremes. Uh, you know, uh, but somebody who's reliable, trustworthy, uh, basically somebody who is temperate also means, uh, and a husband of one wife means somebody who's self-controlled in the areas of the flesh, the mind, the spirit, uh, a sober-minded, somebody who's emotionally stable. Uh, it describes a person who's able to think clearly, uh, think with a lot more clarity in what they're saying, they're doing. Uh, of good behavior, which means that they don't have a, a childish behavior. They're not childish in the way they think and they act. They're mature in their understanding. They're mature in the way they act and do things. Uh, they're not childish. They're hospitable, able to teach. Uh, you know, hospital me hospitable means somebody who's able to uh, welcome people, entertain people in their homes. Uh, notice here he says, you know, able to teach. So in this whole list that he uh, he uh, uh, he he gives out or he enlists for uh, the leaders uh, or the, for a bishop uh, uh, in verses two right up till um, verse seven. You know, uh, it all has to do about a person's basic character. But only one thing he mentions here in this list is about their gifting, which is he says is able to teach. Uh, all the other things that he mentions in the list is all about their character, um, who they are as a person, uh, and just, just one mention of a gift. So you see the importance Paul is giving. Uh, he knows that, you know, a gift comes from God. 
uh, it's uh, you know it's something that God bestows upon us. So when God chooses somebody for an office, He will bestow upon that person the gifts that are required. So it's given from God. It's nothing for us to uh, be concerned about. But what more? What is more important is uh, the character of the person. It's about who the person is the kind of life the person uh, uh, lives that is more important because you know your your gifts um, uh, can take you to places where your character cannot keep you so if you don't have a good character and you have the most excellent gifts you know those gifts cannot keep you in that place for too long uh, if your character cannot uh, sustain you so your gifts can take you to uh, you know where your character cannot sustain you then there is no use because people are looking at your character how you do things how you uh, exhibit those gifts in the context of your character and how you uh, behave so you see in this whole entire list there's only one mention of uh, that, that has to do with uh, the person's gifting uh, which is he saying able to teach and the rest is just dealing with who uh, the person is who they are as a person the kind of life um, that we live is so much important um, it is God's standard and it's God's requirement for a spiritual leader the kind of life that we live our character is uh, so much important uh, that is what God is looking for that is a requirement that God uh, wants our character uh, who we are as a as people important for spiritual leadership so in the church um, you know sometimes we look or emphasize on the gifting uh, of the people of the person the spiritual gifting uh, we look at more than the person's character yes you know spiritual gifting is important uh, but God's word says that these things, uh, 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 the character is also important, uh, you know, uh, for spiritual leadership as well. Not just your gifting, but your character is also important for uh, to hold a position as a spiritual uh, leader. So we need to hold people accountable uh, to this and we need uh, to hold ourselves accountable to this, uh, to hold ourselves accountable to our character. Uh, how we live our uh, lives we just cannot put our gifts on display uh, you know uh, and say okay that's more than enough but uh, each one of us need to hold ourselves I need to hold myself accountable uh, to God's standards uh, of holiness of the character he desires the life that I live uh, even as uh, he's called me to be a spiritual leader even as he's called us uh, to minister yes say Thank you, Pastor. Um, I'm just wondering, going through this passage, um, how do we now balance a man's desire to become a bishop or a deacon and then having a calling from God that I ought to serve in this capacity? How do we balance this with what Paul has just said from to Timothy? Because it's in, it's okay for someone to have a good desire, and maybe yes, all the characters that Paul has listed, he ticks every, everything. He 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 has all that, or she has all that. But it's another thing to say that did God really call me to oversee the souls of men and women of this church, or did God call me to serve in the capacity? as a deacon i don't know how we can just balance this so that at the end of the day we're not just promoting people's zealousness or desire which paul congratulated anyone who wants to who has that desire but at the end of the day we also still go back to the fact that there has to be also a call a real conviction from god how do we balance this uh, scripturally speaking thank you pastor Thank you, Say. So, uh, yes, there's, you know, God calls us to different ministry offices. Uh, well, the membership gifts are given to everyone. Each one of us are given different membership gifts. Uh, but God calls us to uh, specific offices. 
but even as he calls us to specific offices, you know, um, uh, he works in each one of our lives. Uh, and we can also see uh, that in the person, you know, how the person is, uh, you know, the intimacy with God, how they cooperating with God in the whole process of being that leader that God uh, wants them to uh, be but if you if you're saying how can we choose people to different ministry offices uh, how can we discern if that is their call basically people don't rise up to the ranks of uh, to higher ranks you know all of a sudden they grow from stage to stage so when they come to church you know you basically uh, they would just like to uh, volunteer uh, so when they like to volunteer, like to help, they like to be in some position, you know, don't give them uh, 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 leadership positions or titles like uh, like uh, member care coordinator or, um, uh, you know, a welcome team leader. But just let them be people who are, uh, you know, just uh, who are coming uh, every Sunday and just volunteering, just ministering and see their attitude because when we uh, don't give people titles, when we don't give them uh, importance to a, a specific position or give them names or titles or tags uh, and they work irrespective of that, they are committed, they are sincere, uh, 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 look at that, look at their commitment, their sincerity, uh, even though they don't have a specific tag or an office or a name assigned to uh, uh, an office assigned to their name. Uh, you know, uh, just look at their uh, faithfulness in which they do things, their commitment, their zeal, uh, the way they uh, they they work along with the others in the team, uh, whether, uh, you know, they are uh, maintaining good relationships, peace, uh, whether they are looking for, uh, you know, uh, to be recognized. If they're not given recognition, even though they've done something, you know, are they upset? Do they leave church? Do they talk about it do they backbite uh, uh, you know then we uh, we see their character over a, a certain period of time and then we bring them to a level one of uh, a, a leadership position and you know give them a, a certain small position and then if they are faithful there you know give them then they grow up in their ranks so uh, that's where we can see if they're really called to something. You know, if you're called to something, you know, irrespective of whether you get uh, titles, whether you get appreciated, uh, whether you're honored, whether you're respected, uh, you know, uh, even though you don't get all of these things, uh, you still stay faithful to that church, you still serve, you still, uh, you know, are committed uh, to the task that you are uh, called to, that shows uh, their calling, that shows that they're really called to it, they're fully uh, passionate about what they're doing, and, um, you know, then you can give them uh, major leadership positions. But if um, you see them in a place where uh, they are hungry for, uh, you know, for, for a name, a title, and a position, and they're not given, uh, or what they have, you know, given, if somebody else is given that position, does it anger them? Do they leave church? Do they get upset? Then we know that they are not called for a specific thing, but just, you know, it's their, it's out of their own uh, uh, carnal nature, their own selfish desire that they want to come to that position. Did that help, Say? Yes, yes, Pastor, it helped. But what about on the side of the person? Like, how, how do we... Because uh, it's one thing for the leader to say, okay, you will lead. But it's, is, it, is it also important that such a person also is convinced by the Spirit of God to take such leadership role in the church? I, I don't know. Well, what do you think, Pastor? Yes, uh, as I said, God calls us to different offices, uh, different areas of ministry, and uh, they receive that calling and they know for sure that this is where God wants them uh, to be. They also look at their skills, that, their skill sets, their talents. They know, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, this is where God has called them. So we, we are going back to fulfilling God's purpose for their life. The seeds that are there, seeds, I'll be talking about talents. 
the pattern of God's working, the circumstances that he has uh, orchestrated in their lives. Um, so basically knowing, hey, this is where, you know, God has, uh, what God has called me to do. So basically for me, when I uh, joined um, a Bible college, you know, uh, I was interested, I thought my calling was to do counseling. So, uh, you know, but all through, now, even when I was in Bible college, they put me into children's ministry, weekend school, uh, weekend uh, ministry. I was ministering with children in the church where they assigned me. I was They put me with children in the campus where we were staying. They assigned me with children. Uh, even when I wanted to um, do my internship for seven months, I had gone um, to a place where I was looking forward to doing counseling with drug addicts and alcoholics. I did that. But, you know, God orchestrated situations for me where I stayed with children. They picked up from, uh, you know, the railway platforms. Uh, I was ministering to commercial sex workers' children. I was ministering to street children. Uh, and I landed up uh, again ministering to children in schools, the school that the ministry runs. Uh, again, landed up being with children. Then after I finished Bible college, I wanted to go back and, you know, start this whole ministry for counseling for women addicts because they did not have anyone working full time for um, uh, in the 2000s that time. They didn't have anyone working full time for female women addicts uh, counseling them. So I wanted to go and start this project. But somehow God orchestrated things and I was back to ministering to children. So when I look back, I see how God orchestrated. And then I said, uh, you know, situations and circumstances. And, I, and I, then I knew that my calling, uh, yes, was for counseling. Do I loved it and I wanted to work with um, addicts. But uh, uh, I know God was calling me for um, into full time ministry with uh, children. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the way God has led, the way God has taught me um, in Bible college, we never had a course on children's ministry. We never had, you know, uh, 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 ministries that we can learn from about children, but just the Holy Spirit leading, guiding, teaching me, uh, giving me, uh, you know, different uh, ways uh, to uh, minister to children. It's it's just beautiful. So you, you know where God has... Uh, uh, called you so basically for that person the person knows so even if people are trying to uh, move me out of uh, you know to other things I still stay rooted in what uh, God has called me to do while I uh, still minister to you know uh, in other areas as well did that help with an example that, that helped pastor thank you very much thank you pastor this is Charles Yes, Charles. That is awesome. That is very, very awesome. <clears throat> you are touching on the right button. Yes. You remaining focused on what you are called to do, though you are going to serve in other areas. Really, it gives me a greater emphasis on what uh, we are doing, especially when you remain with your mission. Though you are going to serve in other areas, but you remain focused on the the original original call. Thank you so much, Pastor, for this. Thank you, Charles. Louis says, Pastor, are we suggesting that we are called according to giftings or according uh, to character? Uh, I think uh, 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 God knows who we are. Uh, God has designed us and he has ordained us, uh, you know, and has purposes for us. So he, he calls us for a specific task. And when he calls us for a specific task, he gives us the gifts, the skills uh, that would enable us to fulfill that specific assignment, that specific uh, task that he has given to us. Uh, and one way we can know what is our calling is to know what areas that we are gifted in. So gifting for us helps us uh, to know our calling, to recognize our calling. And God also puts these gifts in us because he knows uh, what he has planned and purpose for us and what he has destined for us. Uh, but these gifts and these uh, uh, are, are just kind of an assurance for us to know uh, uh, for sure what is our uh, calling. Um, and character, yes, you know, uh, irrespective of the gifts, a uh, godly character in in a, a, for all of us in any area is very, very uh, important. Because if we don't have the character, 
uh, uh, in any specific area, whether you're in the secular field, the spiritual, whatever, you know, in the church, I mean, uh, you know, if you don't have the character, your your gift is uh, is of no use, your talent is of no use. You know, uh, maybe you're working in a corporate, you're a leader, uh, but, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you don't have a character of being uh, character of being honest, of maintaining integrity, of uh, treating people uh, kindly, nicely, uh, 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 very carnal, uh, fleshly nature, uh, you know, um, the way you treat women, or if I'm a woman leader, the way I treat men, the way I associate with men, uh, the way I behave, uh, I can be a leader, but nobody is going to, uh, you know, uh, look up at me as that, uh, uh, as a leader who they can depend on, they can trust on, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody who they can, uh, somebody they will feel threatened in our presence. Uh, and it's not going to last long, our leadership role, and it's not going to give a good taste to people. And of course, uh, 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 the remarks they make about us, to the HR is not going to also, you know, uh, hold us in that position uh, too long. So uh, your character and gifting go alongside each other. It's very, very important. So, you know, if you don't have a ca good character, your, your gifting is of no use. It cannot keep you where... Uh, it needs to be kept. Just look at Moses. You know, Moses um, uh, uh, was trained up in in the house of Pharaoh, and uh, he knew he's you know uh, uh, going to be the uh, the person who's going to lead the people out of Israel. But uh, he uh, kind of overstepped his boundaries, and then you know, uh, at the age of eighty, when God calls him. Uh, he's not very confident, but then finally, when he steps into that role as a as a leader, uh, we look at his character. You know, he's not somebody who steps back like he did before. You know, when God called him at the age of eighty, he gave various reasons. But when he was much younger, at the age of forty, he was so zealous to you know uh, to show to prove to his fellow men that you know he was on their side. He killed that Egyptian. Uh, but you know, when at the age of eighty, he he was not confident enough to be that leader. But when he becomes that leader that God calls him to be, he gets into that shoes, and God says, uh, "Hey Moses, you know, I'm tired of these people. I'm not going to lead them anymore. You lead them." What does uh, Moses say? Moses could have thrown the towel in, so to say, and he could have said, "Hey God, when you are God and you get tired with these people, I'm just a human being. Don't you think I am tired of?" their constant bickering and their murmuring and their complaining, uh, God, give me a break, you know, I too, uh, choose somebody else as a leader. But what does Moses do? He does not run away. He does not, uh, you know, uh, opt out of that situation. But he reminds God of his promise and what he said. And he says, God, if your presence does not go with us, you know, don't send us from this place and I'm not going. Uh, you know, and he buys God back into that equation of uh, uh, leading people, uh, his people, and he does. He he stays with them. He journeys with them till the very uh, end of his life, till God chooses another leader when he is uh, old enough. Uh, so um, uh, you know, so that was a calling on his life, and his you know, the calling, the gifting goes along with his uh, with the character, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, that is why he's, uh, you know, uh, a man who was able to, you know, one man who was able to speak to God face to face, so to say, was so close to God, who God would reveal to him uh, was because of his character. What if his character was not right? You think God would have uh, revealed himself to Moses, spoken himself to Moses? No, because, uh, you know, there was no grace at that time. Uh, sin was, uh, you know, punished severely. Uh, so yes, we see that uh, gifting and character is equally important. Did that help, Louis? Okay, there's no response from Louis. We'll uh, continue. Okay, so uh, uh, it's so important uh, here that he's talking about the character. He goes on in verses uh, 3 to Paul says, writes, not, uh, the, the bishop should not be given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, uh, not quarrelsome, and not covetous. So uh, 
not violent. Uh, the person, the uh, the uh, the spiritual leader, the bishop should be gentle, should not be violent. That means this man who's not given uh, to violence either publicly or privately at home. Uh, uh, but you know, somebody who lets God uh, uh, fight his case when, uh, when when there is injustice, when he sees things that are not right, he will let just God fight his case. But not somebody who fights and who's not violent, who's not quarrelsome, a kind of person who's not always fighting over something or the other. You know, uh, we have leaders who are constantly quarrelsome, fighting. Uh, for every little thing, what somebody said, what somebody didn't do, um, what somebody reported about them, getting back to people, you know. Uh, so here Paul says that, you know, they should not be quarrelsome, not fighting for anything and everything, uh, not being covetous. Uh, you know, this is not just uh, somebody who's uh, uh, merely greedy for money or encompassing wealth or money, but a covetous man. Uh, is somebody who's not never satisfied with anything. Whatever they have, they're not satisfied, always demanding something more, uh, demanding something different. Uh, so a, a covetous man is somebody who is um, constantly dissatisfied and you know uh, you know and such a man is not fit for leadership among God's people because he's basically not satisfied uh, 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 with himself and that is why um, Paul writes and says, uh, you know, godliness with contentment uh, is great uh, gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. He writes that to his, uh, you know, the church at Ephesus, he writes that in his letter uh, to Timothy. So he's saying they should not be covetous. Uh, and in verse 4, he says, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. So it's important that the bishop, even before he becomes a spiritual overseer, spiritual spiritual leader, spiritual minister in the house of God, uh, you know, it's important that he has his own home or his own family in order. When he has his own family and home in order, then, you know, uh, it, uh, he can have, uh, uh, he can put the house of God in order. He can have the house of God in order. So if your house is in order, uh, it means that you're in a place of strength uh, to minister to others as well. You're more confident to minister to others. Verse 6, not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Uh, so what basically Paul is telling Timothy is don't put somebody who's new uh, to the church, a new believer, you know, uh, uh, don't be quick in putting them in the position of spiritual leadership, uh, you know, let uh, take time uh, to observe them, to see how they grow, how they're maturing, uh, you know, their commitment, their zeal, their passion, their dedication. Uh, and why is he saying don't have somebody who is a new believer, don't put them into leadership position is because if, if you do, you know, basically, firstly, you don't know them very well. You don't know because they come from this whole uh, baggage of a cultural uh, mindset, which is pagan. Uh, they need to understand the law, the order, the ordinances of the church, the doctrines, the way things function in church. Um, so that needs time for them to gather, to understand, to relearn, to unlearn. Uh, and also he says the other thing is so that they're not filled with pride because Satan, you know, um, uh, fell because of his pride. The main reason why Satan um, uh, uh, was, you know, uh, 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 sinned was because of his pride. The re main reason why he fell was because of his pride. And um, you know, so this person, uh, when we bring them to uh, a person who's new, we bring them to leadership position, but when they can fall because of their pride, uh, they'll come under the same condemnation as, uh, as Satan, uh, you know, and it's sad. They will be cast away from the presence of God because God resists the proud uh, and, you know, they'll be totally disconnected from the presence of God. So why put that person into all of this? Uh, you know, difficulty and harm and struggle. Uh, just wait, take time, uh, learn uh, the person, see how the person is doing, how they're growing and maturing, and then, uh, you know, uh, take that step of giving them a leadership role. And then he goes on to say, moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the uh, 
uh, devil. Now, if you want to understand this verse, we can just read it in the uh, easy to read uh, version. Uh, it says, an elder must also have the respect of people who are not part of the church, then he will not be criticized by others and be caught in the devil's uh, trap. So Paul is saying it's not important for a bishop just to have you know a good name a good testimony among the people in the church but also need to have a good testimony with people who are part of the you know in the in the world who are outside the church uh, if not when you bring them to leadership positions you know they'll be criticized by others and uh, again you know that will bring their downfall satan will easily trap them and they will be uh, condemned so this is important uh, you know for uh, part of being a leader that we have a good conduct a good relationships in the church we have good conduct good relationships with also people outside the church as well in the world our neighbors uh, uh, and other acquaintances in the world so the way a spiritual leader must live basically paul is saying he must be faultless before uh, god uh, believers the saints in the church and before the uh, world because if he's uh, you know if he's condemned in the world if he's disgraced in the world uh, then devil can use that as a trap to bring him down and uh, we've seen this as in history it's very evident in history how great ministers you know fell because uh, the world uh, reported something wrong that they were doing or indulging in and um, so it's important for us to maintain a good a character, good conduct, a good testimony uh, uh, in the eyes of uh, the fellow saints or believers and also people in the world. So it's not only important for us to live right in the sight, but also of people in the world. Okay. Um, so Kennedy says, is a glass of one or two of wine after meals be considered as drunkenness? Uh, for a leader, uh, well, I um, uh, well, a glass can be small and big, so I'm just imagining the the size of it. Uh, and you're saying one or two. Uh, uh, well, um, you know, um, just uh, looking at what Scripture says, uh, you know, we'll talk about this, but uh, uh, it's important that uh, you know. Uh, 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 what we have at APC is you no, know, we don't uh, leaders are you know, we don't drink wine uh, because it can lead into uh, other temptations. It can lead uh, into drinking, uh, you know, uh, alcohol uh, because wine. You know, everyone starts off with just one cigarette, smoking one cigarette, just one peg of uh, or a glass of wine, or uh, just one, uh, you know. Uh, those of a drug but then you know our body craves for more uh, because we don't have control over our will and we're just opening the doors to the evil one so uh, i would say you know uh, if you can do without it it's good you know uh, even one or two glass of wine after meals uh, will not be considered as drunkenness for a leader but it can lead into other things we can get into other temptations what do the others think other thoughts anyone else has any other thoughts this is something of uh, a contention that we have every time we uh, when i teach uh, first timothy what do others have to say about this Anyone? Okay. Uh, yes, Charles, you can go ahead and then I'll read. Okay. Go ahead, Charles, tell us. Yes. Um, nowadays, the wine that is on the market has alcohol. To me, I think the the wine they were using it during the time of Paul might have not been having alcohol content. So 
it might be very good or it was good for healing for all that but currently wine was commercialized and it has alcohol in it and there is a very big spirit very big spirit addictive spirit in alcohol any alcohol the moment you begin on it you keep on increasing until you become totally taken by it so me i, I suggest that we we avoid we avoid we can we can have another we can have another drink not wine after a meal you can have another drink very healthy one you can get substitutes uh, that can be used after a, a, a meal and any other dessert it can be juice so me i suggest that as bishops as overseers as the spiritual leaders we avoid alcohol thank you thank you uh, charles anyone else ma'am as a personal experience mm-hmm. shall I, can you hear me yes i can hear you go ahead rupa uh, uh whenever i had very bad cold or uh, this uh, sinus problem my mm-hmm. um, husband used to give me a small uh, not very little a tablespoon like doctor's brandy something like that mm-hmm. one it was this winter season we went for carols and came back and he was about to give me a small dose of it because i was having a very bad cold he told me that he heard the voice of god very clearly speaking to him saying this is my sermon please don't give it to her and he was very frightened when he heard the uh, the voice of god he never gave me that again maybe it's very for uh, when we are in leadership positions is very important to god that I, in my personal experience i never touched it again thank you ma'am thank you okay so uh, you know anyone else likes to share if you look at first uh, timothy chapter 5 verse 23 you know uh, um paul says you know tells timothy no longer drinking only water but use a little wine for your stomach sake and for your uh, frequent uh, uh, infirmities so you know the word uh, uh, little you know used by paul uh, uh, of course it just means uh, little in number small in quantity and there it was you know for medical uh, purposes uh, because he had these frequent infirmities uh, but you know um, today we don't need to use wine for our uh, uh, infirmities because we have we are well advanced in the age the time that we're living in uh, in uh, in medicine in the field of medicine um, therefore you know paul is not talking there about social drinking or uh, regular drinking or drunkenness uh, but you know drinking wine or alcohol uh, definitely you know opens the door for uh, a regular habit uh, uh, which can lead progressively to to being alcoholic uh, to being alcohol dependent uh, or becoming a alcoholic or you know uh, be having a habit of drinking uh, alcohol and when we know when we drink alcohol it definitely uh, you know lowers our inhibitions it uh, impairs our judgments our reflexes our coordination uh, so uh, you know the, the bible is also very clear about uh, the sin of uh, drunkenness uh, you know uh, it says in proverbs chapter 20 you know wine is a mocker uh, you know uh, a strong drink is a brawler uh, and it also in in this in proverbs it says so don't mix wine with uh, uh, with wine pipers or you know with those who are uh, you know gluttonous who love to eat um, uh, you know um, uh, proverbs if you look at proverbs chapter 23 uh, you know um, it says 29 to 33 says who has woe who has sorrow who has contentions uh, who has complaints who has wounds without cause who has redness of eyes 
those who linger long at the wine, uh, those who go in search of mixed wine. Uh, so it says, do not look on the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. Uh, and at, the, at last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perversive um, uh, things. And uh, even when Paul writes in uh, Galatians chapter 5, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, before that, he mentions in verses uh, 19 to 21, he talks about uh, the, the the fruits of the, and the, of the flesh. And he talks about, uh, you know, adultery and outbursts of anger, jealousies. And he also talks about uh, drunkenness. Uh, over there and he says those who practice such things will not inherit uh, the kingdom of wine so um, while it's true that you know bible has references about drinking wine condemns drunkenness and not being at, uh, addicted to too much of wine um, uh, there are also verses in the bible that warns us about drinking wine or a strong drink and being uh, led astray by it just like i read from you know, uh, said from, uh, you know, First uh, 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 Timothy chapter 25, verse 23, and Proverbs chapter 20, you know, it leads us astray, resulting in uh, long judgment, and poor choices uh, uh, that we uh, make. If you look at, uh, read basically Proverbs chapter 20 and Proverbs chapter 23, you know, uh, you can uh, you can read that. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we need to be mindful about what we are drinking, what we are indulging in. Like Charles says, you know, drink something that is more healthy, uh, which, you know, a healthy thing which can help you because just taking one glass or two glasses of wine can lead you into, you know, progressively getting into much more harder drinks, uh, which can get you alcoholic uh, uh, dependent. So, uh, uh, you know, and also the biblical principle uh, to be mindful of is that uh, of our responsibility as, uh, you know, mature believers to help those who are not. So, you know, Paul tells in um, Romans chapter 14, it's good neither to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles and is offended uh, or makes him weaker in his faith. Remember, we studied this, you know, if something causes you to sin, uh, maybe drinking wine for you might be a part of your culture, but for some some other believer, when he sees that, hey, you know, this person is um, uh, is uh, it, it leads our life group or is uh, teaching in church, he's a leader, he's an elder in the church, and he's drinking wine, uh, it can cause them to stumble, but they won't be able to see the cultural reference to you drinking wine. Uh, but Paul is saying, you know, uh, you know, whether you eat meat or, you know, you drink wine, whatever, do it in a way that brings, uh, that edifies another person. But if it's going to cause your brother to stumble, you know, um, uh, don't do that. Uh, and, you know, even in First Corinthians chapter 8, uh, you know, Paul says, you know, food does not condemn us to God. Uh, for, you know, if we eat, uh, we are not better. Or if we do not eat, we are, we are not worse. But, you know, if we somehow use our freedom or our liberty that we have to become a stumbling block to others, then, you know, uh, might as well not eat it, both for your conscience sake and for uh, the person who is um, uh, watching you. So, you know, he says, you know, in uh, First Corinthians chapter 8, so if your food food makes a brother stumble, he says, I will never eat meat again uh, because I don't want to cause my brother to stumble. Or if my eating food that is offered to idols, which for me is not going to do anything and I believe that it's not going to affect me, but if I, if a brother sees me eating it and it's going to, you know, uh, uh, kind of bring a stumbling block to his faith, then Paul says, uh, I might as well not do it. So the question we need to basically ask is, you know, should I drink wine? Should I uh, do this? Should I do that? Uh, the question we need to ask ourselves is God being glorified in what we do? Okay, so that's what Paul says in First Corinthians chapter 10, right? Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of 
uh, God. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 17, whatever you do in word or do deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God, uh, 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 you know, the, God the Father through him. So uh, is my wine uh, glorifying God? It's bringing glory to God? Or it's just going to destroy my body and get me into other things? I might as well um, not do it. Uh, 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 should I watch movies? Um, you know, uh, uh, it's okay for people to watch good movies, but if my movies is not going to, you know, it's not going to glorify God, it's not going to glorify the time that I'm, the way I'm using my time, I might as well not uh, watch movies. So, uh, you know, that is a question uh, we need to ask ourselves. And another important question we need to ask ourselves is, you know, am I setting myself up for other addictions? You know, uh, uh, like Paul writes in First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, all things are lawful, uh, but all things are not helpful. Okay, so all things are lawful for me to do, but I will not be brought under the power of uh, anything. So, you know, you have, you have the freedom to do it, but is it going to help you? You know, or it's going to bring you under that power of that other addiction. And so we need to know that, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, we need to be careful that we don't open the doors for Satan to, uh, you know, enter in. So, um, uh, you know, sexual ad adultery, what Jesus says, you know, is you've already committed sexual adultery when you already have that thought in your uh, mind, you know. Uh, so it's basically when you, you know, when you see something, it leads to a thought and the thought leads to action. That action becomes your habit. That habit becomes your character, who you are. Uh, so if it's not going to glorify God, it's, if it's something that is going to, you know, uh, not going to help you, uh, it's going to bring you under that power, then, you know, it might as well uh, not do that. So these are reasons, uh, you know, why we don't want to drink wine and necessarily open up our life to alcohol and its effects and uh, that is why we have this as you know uh, uh, one of our church uh, staff policy is that you know we should not be drinking wine because it can lead into other things did that help who asked that question uh, yeah kennedy did that help kennedy okay Oh my gosh, we have passed two minutes of our time. So sorry, I didn't look at the time. I got caught up in uh, talking about wine. Okay, uh, thank you all for joining class. We'll uh, look at uh, the rest of First Timothy chapter 3 um, and next week. Have a blessed day and a blessed week ahead. God bless you. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.